All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Frank Passetta, who is up in lovely Columbus, Ohio. How are you doing, Frank? I'm doing great today. Thanks, John. <laughs> And Frank has had an outstanding um, sales and executive management career, and he's published two highly, highly regarded motivational books, Stop Whining and Start Winning and Don't Fire Them Up, Fire Them Up. Uh, and um, they're highly quoted, uh, highly quoted books. And the book, the first book you wrote, I think, back in 1990 is still selling briskly today, which shows the enduring nature of the ideas, right? Yeah, it's still doing well. You know, it's it's funny. Um, the, uh, I'm recently retired, and the last role I had was the executive vice president of a company that had been in business about 50 years before I got there, and we opened three new markets. Wow! And in in less than 14 years, we grew that market to over 50 million. And as we were talking a little bit before, just going back to the old basics, you know. Everybody talks about getting talented people and then we fall short of it. So we really worked hard to make sure our top technology was our people. Mm -hmm. um, we had great product to sell, but man, if you ain't got talent, you're going to hit a wall. And we were very, very fortunate. So a lot of stuff from the book in 1994 really holds true today. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh Finding top talent is is a struggle for a lot of companies, uh, and for a number of reasons. Number one is, you know, top talent, generally speaking, aren't out there looking for jobs. They've already got jobs, and and second off, I guess it's defining what what does top talent look like to you. What's the correct profile? Right. So you got two issues with the top talent, right? Because so many of the larger companies are in the cookie cutter, right? Mm -hmm. Here's our salary line, and when they get somebody really good, they might move the line, the percentile, which makes no not no real mm -hmm. impact, and one size fits all. And you just can't do that. I mean, if you relate, sales to me is athletic, mm -hmm. right? So you don't pay LeBron James the same as you pay the Dudley guy on on another team. So how do you take the risk when you're recruiting? Right. That we're going to go outside of our financial box, if you will. And then you have to be relentless on the talent. It's just like sales. If you go after two or three and you wine and dine, and, you know, and they say no, all of a sudden you're empty. You know, in, in sales, if you get three deals out of 10, it's like baseball. You're in the mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. So who is relentlessly looking for new talent? Because we, we 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 take pot shots at it from, oh, we're about to, you know, there's a meeting, we need talent, we do it for a few weeks. And then who is relentlessly pushing that? And then does the executive team have the stomach and the guts to say, you know what, this John's really, really good. We're going to pay him what we need to get him. Um, mm -hmm. To my company's credit that I left Comdoc, they did that with me 14 years ago. And to the executive's credit, you know, where they thought there might be some jealousy or whatever, you know, they were willing because of my background to say, hey, maybe this guy can take us to a next level. So when you got a next level man or woman, you got to go get him. Mm -hmm. And if you go get him, you have to have the 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 mindset that, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So if you bring in top talent, even if you're paying them more, it'll eventually, it'll impact everybody positively. No, no question, you know, and, and, it, and it lets other people, you know, they, they just see that new, it's just like when you bring in a really good new leader, right, all of a sudden there's more energy and there's inspiration and they just feel there's a different expectation in the room. Instead of that same old ho-hum, you know, you know, what are you offering? 50 grand. Well, you're going to get 50 grand. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you're going to get. And we all hope they develop into the next great one. But some, you got to go get some great ones. So go, going back to something that you uh, raised earlier. So quite often we we recruit when there is a crisis or somebody quits and there's an opening or we put together a new budget and we say, oh, here are the extra people uh, we can recruit. But it always seems to be uh, something that's driven, that's reactive or driven by an event as, oppo as opposed to pro um, proactive. Right. right. And you, and that spins it back to leadership, right? Who who really is going to have the gumption to keep pushing and staying on the talent? And it, and it really is 
your number one thing because the, the and it's so easy to back off, right? You're in the boardroom and you're going through the finances and the quarter was soft or whatever. My first answer with that, let's go, let's go get more talented people. How, how do I get somebody who's going to generate that revenue we're talking about? So I think if I, if I was talking to a group of leaders, I would say, when's the last time you actually went out and recruited. You know, we all have, again, back to the cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. So like, the person in charge of HR, well, we have a process. The hell with your process. <laughs> Who's the number one competitor in your, in your area? Do you know who the top rep is? Are you talking to them? Who's the top manager for that company, right? So it's really a hands-on from leadership all the way down. I'm a 2-4 from the University of Dayton. I'm a reformed underachiever. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. The, the, the two things I've done really well, I really enjoy inspiring people. I think once you then bring in this talent, then you got to work hard to keep it because being mm -hmm. great is difficult to sustain. Um, and the other thing is recruiting. I, if, if I've done anything well, I'm relentless. I've had people that have come and gone that I've gone back after. And you just know that they can move the number for you. So what's your key to recruiting? To say you identify a, a top talent, a LeBron James, a star, somebody you think right. is going to move the needle. How do you go out? How do you, uh, what kind of process do you use to actually land that person? So, you know, in today, in today's environment, there are so many great tools, right? You can do the LinkedIn and the headhunters and all that type of thing. So how do you go identify you know, somebody who has really moved the needle at their company. You know, how do you, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I'm working with a headhunter or word of mouth or contacts, and a lot of my recruiting is through people I know and from my industry, you know, who really is an, Im an impact player? And then how do we get in touch with them and bring them into the organization? A couple of things. Some people will disagree with this. There was a basketball player named Dennis Rodman. He was a pain in the ass to yep. deal with. But they won championships. I'd rather finish second than to have him on my team, mm -hmm. right? So if you really believe in talent, then you also believe in the culture that you've built. So who's going to come in and be a positive impact on that culture and get you those numbers, mm -hmm. right? If I get you, John, I'm going to get the next recruit. I'm going to get, boy, this is when they come in to meet you or you take them out on a sales call or my young up and comers go, man, I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, I look for somebody who, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the superstar. And it's interesting you say that, though, it's uh, the, the superstar, but it has to be the superstar who brings the cultural fit, who's going to be yes. a positive ad. You know, obviously, like you said, unlike maybe somebody like Mr. Rodman, who was our ambassador to North Korea for a while. right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes full credit. Yeah. yeah when you have somebody like that, it takes too much of your energy. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, the, the, the key to any leadership is to be genuine and honest. And if I really trust you, mm -hmm. like people say, well, the millennials today, let me tell you what, my two kids are millennials and they're terrific salesmen. The apples kind of stuck to the tree. Mm -hmm. We can't do much else, but Pacetas can sell. Um, and I trust them. If I trust a rep, I'm not looking for them, you know, it's five o'clock or four thirty. If I trust you, I'm gonna inspire and I'm gonna push you for more. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm gonna hold you accountable, you know, saying, I need you to make this basket. We need we need this extra. And if they believe in it and what you're doing and they're a good teammate, they'll do that. <laughs> Some will just go like this and walk away, right? Yeah, if they, if they exactly. don't believe in it. If the culture sucks. Exactly. So, okay. So if you find uh, the the superstar and you bring them in, then how do you integrate them into the organization? Because as you mentioned earlier, if you're going after a superstar and you're going, okay, I'm going to have to break the salary structures right. and I'm going to have to land this person. Uh, obviously, you have the issue of envy over money. You have, oh, this person's coming in from the outside or who's the, here's a new flavor of the month. So how do you ensure that those things don't happen and it's, yeah, a, it's a positive transition? That's a great question. So part of that is you're going to have to have a tough discussion, right? You know, there really is no magic wand. I would bring my, my, my head people in, my senior team, and say, hey, here's a decision you know, that we've decided to make and how it's going to impact the company Right. And also we wanted to communicate this to you before we do it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. but also show you what we think this can mean to the company, which also trickles to everybody in this room, right? Here's the numbers. Here's where we've been. Here's where we'd like to get to, right? Now, if we want to crawl along, you know, in a lot of companies today, it, when, when I was young, you were required to do 10% year over year. Mm -hmm. Today, if you're even year over, over year <laughs> and you're finding a way to protect profit, that's okay. But I think you have to have the discussion. You know what, John, I need you to be with me. I know this is a challenge. Competition is good, right? I need more out of everybody in the room. And I think bringing Frank in is going to really give us the emphasis we need to move forward. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that person needs you to clear the deck for them, right? And yeah. when you leave the room, you may not be completely on board, but you have no misunderstanding that we're bringing him in and this is what's expected. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think that's a really uh, critical point there is, is setting those clear expectations. So as you say... Yeah, you may not be a hundred percent on board with it. You may not be a hundred percent happy. You may not right. totally, totally agree with it, but at least right. the expectation has been set. So you know this is going ahead. Right, right. Uh, Communicate. You know, the more the more we can do that. Surprises. And nobody likes to be surprised in business. Mm -hmm. So then, if you bring in you bring in the superstar uh, and you, you've settled everybody down a little bit. Uh, how do you ensure that that person hits the ground running and that there isn't, uh, you know, there isn't too long a bedding in period where people get the opportunity to sort of second guess your decision? Right. And a lot of that's part of the recruiting process. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so when we're recruiting, we, we, we tend to overdo it with the client, with the person we're bringing in. Right. Mm -hmm. They're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I think it's important before they come on board to be explicit about your culture what you're looking for them to do. John, I'm going to put you in a position to win because I want you to win early. Here's the book of business. But here's what, you know, here's what we're, we are really going to be looking from a performance standpoint. And also after six months, I always ask this question on an interview. Tell me what your teammates are going to say about you six months from now. Mm. Right. And will they say, you know what, I was a little curious, suspectful, skeptical, but good Lord, what an impact this, this lady or man has made on our business. But I think, you have, hey, we're going to get this guy or lady, but then you got to sit down and say, John, before we, before we get married here, hmm. let me lay out what, what we really, really need from you and what we'll be expecting so that there's no surprises with us either. Yeah, I, I think that's a I think that's a great point as well because uh, you have to set up those milestones or whatever. I like I love that question. By the way, is what are people going to say about you, your colleagues, in in six months? Because that really forces them to think about the impact they're having on other people while they're while they're getting used to the organization. Shall we say? Right, right. And I think I think again, if you have the right character, person with culture, that hits them. Mm -hmm. I, I knew when I started at Comdoc, hell, I was 51 years old and had, had a good pedigree with the books. And I kind of knew what people were thinking. It was so incumbent on me not only to perform, but be a great teammate, right, where these guys and ladies went, wow, man, what a nice pickup. So I, I felt that. You and I have run across people that will give you the nod, the New York nod, and they're going to hear, right, I'm in this thing for myself, you know, and, and, and that just simply doesn't work long term. Because they'll they'll leave you again, right? They'll go to the next high bid. Absolutely. And then uh, how do you then leverage that high performer to uh, affect in a positive way all those people around them, as we say, like lift everybody up and be, right. that, be that role model? So not just come in and be a kind of solo star performer, but also have an impact organizationally. Right. So what, whoever he or she is, they have the it factor. So how do we take, you can't transform the whole thing, but how does that rub off on the organization? So again, back to the cookie cutter, instead of the cookie cutter training, and this is how we do it. By the way, whenever I hear a CEO or somebody say, this is how we do it, get the body bags ready because you're, 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 you're probably falling behind your competition, is how do I get the next group of up and comers to watch John in action. How does he teach them? How does he go out on a call with him? Let him hold in office meetings and things like that, right? Which I think makes you feel good, right? Mm -hmm. As the performer, but also, and, and you'll watch the room, right? It's it's always a third, a third, a third. 
you've given speeches looking back at your profile. I always thought when you watch this audience, John, a third are going to kind of be sitting there like this because their boss has told them they had to come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. The other third are kind of going, all right, this is better than working. But then there's that third taking notes and Mm -hmm. not. Right. So I don't want to waste the great performer's time when they when he or she goes to train. I want them to train the next her. Right. Make sense. Oh, yeah, makes total sense. So you want to actually identify the high potentials and make sure those are the ones and not wasted on the people Correct. that you right. know, that would that it would be a waste for. Correct. Yeah, I agree. Although nowadays you notice it's a, the third of the audience aren't taking notes; they're taking photos constantly. Right, they're taking. <laughs> I don't know if I like. I was giving a speech last week. They were doing that, and I got it made me a little bit nervous. I <laughs> exactly. Okay. In in the last few moments we have here, Frank, uh, can you do you want to tell people just a little bit more about yourself and uh, and how they can learn more about you and what your future plans are? Yeah. So um, you know, I've been I've been very fortunate. I've been in sales my whole life. I think it's the greatest profession in the world. When I give a speech, I'll say I went to the University of Dayton. I'll I'll always tell the sales reps in there, you know, a lot of you, if you perform and do the right things, you'll make more than the doctor you're going to or the lawyer who's doing your contract. Um, And to be damn proud of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I I believe in the impossible. Uh, I'm an enormous sports fan. I don't know why your business and culture can't be like a great sports team or a great family. I've seen that that can be done. And I'm absolutely driven to surround myself with great with great people. And I've been fortunate to do that. So the next adventure, I'm 65 now. After what I just told you, I want to go get that team and have one more rodeo. How do we go find the right product, right, that 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 can separate itself from the rest of its industry? But let's go. Let's go have five or six Michael Jordans. Let's not settle for one and see how move fast we can move that needle. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome uh, that's an awesome objective. A team of five Michael Jordans, or or if you're a a, a soccer fan, a team of like eleven Lionel Messi's, all in the right positions, obviously. Uh, yeah, I think that's fantastic, uh, Frank. So this has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. Uh, Frank Passetta, this has been really, really interesting. I I would definitely advise you to go check out Frank's books. As we said, it's enduring wisdom. If if your books are still selling, uh, you published in 1990 or so, and they're they're still selling briskly, it means there's enduring wisdom in there, folks. So I would encourage you to go check them out. All well, right, thanks. appreciate. It. Yeah. All right, I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Uh, Again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thank you.